Calvert Library. Welcome to It's Elementary. Today our topic is science and we are going to read a story and then do an activity. So let me show you what our book is today. We are reading Solving the Puzzle Under the Sea, Marie Tharp Maps the Ocean Floor. This book is written by Robert Burley, illustrated by Raoul Colon. And I would like to thank the publisher, Simon and Schuster, for giving us permission to enjoy this book today. So our book is actually a true story about Marie Tharp. Marie Tharp entered the science field back in the 1940s, which wasn't easy for women back then. So she really led the way for women in science. So let me go ahead and get my book opened up. And here we go, let's learn about Marie Tharp. Maps, I love them. I love the flow of colors and lines. I love the way I can trace a path with my finger across mountains or valleys until my finger has traveled thousands of miles from here to there on just one page. I sometimes feel a map is talking to me. Marie, it says, have an adventure, explore, discover something new. And once I did. I'm Marie Tharp, and my love of maps began way back in the 1930s when I was a girl. My father's job was to make maps that helped farmers understand different kinds of soil and what they could be used for. I liked to watch as dad drew his maps. Sometimes I held his pads and pencils as he worked. Dad traveled from state to state to make his maps, from Michigan to Iowa to Alabama and beyond. And the whole family moved along with him. I had attended 17 schools by the time I graduated high school. Try topping that. Sometimes in class, I'd gaze at a large map that hung on the wall. There was France, there was South Africa, there was China, and always the vast oceans. I had never seen a real ocean. What would it be like to look out at nothing but dark blue as far as the eye could see? When I was in college, a teacher pointed out that though the oceans covered more than half the Earth's surface, Scientists knew very little about the bottom of the seas. And what did the seafloor really look like? No one seemed to know for sure. At last, I was a young scientist, graduated from college and eager to work. But was science ready for me? In those days, it wasn't easy being both a woman and a scientist. Once I applied for a scientific job, they told me, we don't need any more file clerks. Because I was a woman, they assumed the only thing I was capable of was taking care of their files. Even at the Ocean Studies Lab at Columbia University in New York, my first boss, Doc Ewing, told me a woman couldn't go out on the research ships. Having a woman on a ship is bad luck, he said. I was amazed. It was 1948. Wasn't science supposed to be free of silly superstitions? But I bit my tongue. That wasn't going to stop me. I was determined. I took on every little task I could, helping here, assisting there. Yes, I was bored sometimes. Once I even thought of quitting, but I kept on. I was looking for something that really excited me something that might lead to a new idea in the world of science. At the lab, I worked hard and made lots of friends. One of those friends was Bruce Heason, a colleague who worked with me on several projects. Both of us were interested in breaking new ground. How deep were the oceans? Were there mountains beneath the sea? Or was the bottom mostly flat? One day we had an exciting idea. Could the seafloor really be mapped? I thought so, and I wanted to give it a try. 
People had long attempted to measure the depth of the oceans. Sailors once lowered weighted ropes to make such measurements. More recently, scientists had begun using machines that sent sound waves from a ship to the seafloor and back again. Using the time it took for the echoes to go and come bouncing back, it was possible to figure out the depth at various points. These measurements are called soundings. As time passed, more soundings were made, including some by my friend Bruce, and these soundings gave me my starting point. You have to think big, I told myself. I hauled a large table into my workroom and covered it with a huge sheet of paper. To me, it was a blank canvas filled with possibilities. I couldn't wait to get started. I began by drawing the coastlines, first of the Americas, then of Africa. Between these coasts lay my target, the wide Atlantic Ocean. Next, I slowly collected all the soundings available and placed their numbers carefully where they belonged on my map. Each sounding told the ocean's depth at one point. If the sounding number was, say, 16,000 feet, it meant the ocean was 16,000 feet deep right there. And if at a nearby point the depth was, say, only 8,000 feet deep, the sudden difference between the two numbers meant there was probably a mountain-like peak rising upward. And yes, there are mountains beneath the ocean, just as there are on land. It was like piecing together an immense jigsaw puzzle. I felt like a detective solving a great mystery. I was a scientist at last. Pinpointing the soundings helped me slowly understand the shape of the Atlantic's floor. From its shallow shores, to its gradual drop-offs where the water deepened, to a long underwater mountain chain called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that ran deep below the surface, north to south. I was a kind of artist, too. I used colors to show similar depths, shades of brown, blue, and green. Did all this take time? Yes. Even so, making a scientific discovery is worth it. I couldn't see it with my eyes, yet a portrait of the ocean floor was coming into view. But there was even more. Listen. I noticed something else, something new and important. The depth numbers on my map suggested that a deeper, narrow valley divided the seafloor of the Mid-Atlantic into two parts. At that time, most scientists believed the Earth's surface never moved. The Earth, of course, moved around the sun, yet the Earth's surface, so these scientists assumed, was fixed, unmoving. Other scientists, though, thought differently. They had an idea, or hypothesis, that the Earth's entire surface was divided into several gigantic parts, or plates. They thought these plates were being forced apart by deep sea earthquakes and volcanoes that occurred along the plate edges. And because the continents rested on these plates and moved as they moved, the new theory was called plate tectonics or continental drift. Was the new theory true? I believed it was. My map showing the deep crack or rift running between the mountain peaks of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was telling me so. As I continued working, others wandered in and out of my room, arguing about continental drift. Was it true? Yes, no, yes, no. Scientists are like that. They question everything. Nothing is for sure until it's really for sure. Even my friend Bruce refused to believe the new theory at first. But I ran my finger down the map, following the narrow path of the north-south rift at the center of the Atlantic Ocean's mountain chain. I smiled to myself, remembering that a picture is worth a thousand words. 
Bruce at last nodded and agreed. It felt good. I knew we were changing the way people looked at the earth. We asked a landscape painter from Austria to help us with our map's final printed version. I still remember the first time I saw it, with its rich colors, many markings, plains, and peaks. I felt like an explorer gazing at a newly discovered part of the world. Other people agreed, I guess, because when the map was published, it appeared in museums, in schools, and even on the walls of many homes. Was I proud of myself? You bet. I had a fascinating job that led me to map a once unknown part of the earth and to discover things as I went along. That's about as big as it gets. And yes, my map helped prove that the earth's surface is moving too. But don't worry, you won't lose your balance. We're only moving about an inch or two each year. The end. So as you can see in our book, Marie Tharp really led the way in mapping the seafloors, and her work helped to prove the theory of continental drift. It's pretty weird to think that the ground beneath us is slowly moving. But let's take a look at this last page again, because this has to do with our activity. So you can see Marie Tharp's map up here. That's the one they're all looking at. And that is what our activity is. We are going to make our own map like Marie Tharp's. So in yellow, you can see the land and you have the different continents. So some of them we see are North America. There's the Africa, we've got Russia up here. South America would be down here, Australia. So those are some of the continents. And then we have the water in blue, there are, there's our um, oceans. So let me show you the materials you are going to need to make your map. So the first one we need is a tin tray, or you could use like a cookie sheet or a baking pan. Most importantly, you're going to need some Play-Doh or clay. So I have yellow, that's what I'm using for my land or my continents. And then I have blue for the, for, um, the oceans, for my water. Now these are just little bags here because oh, you will need more Play-Doh than this. So hopefully you have more. I have big tubs, so I've got plenty. But work with what you have. You could do a smaller map. It doesn't have to be too big. So there's my Play-Doh. You will need some white paper. I've got some paper to draw on. Some colored pencils. I've got lots of colored pencils or crayons or markers, whatever you prefer. And you will also need some scissors. I have a big pair of scissors. Maybe you have a small pair. If you need help cutting, make sure you ask a grown up, okay? You should always be very careful with your scissors. So those are all the materials that you need. Go ahead and pause the video. And when you've got everything, come on back and we will start our activity. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is make your continents. So the way that I made mine was by making a ball with my Play-Doh. So I use yellow for my continents. And then you flatten your ball out so you can make your continent into any shape that you want. Once you have your continents made, then you can add them into your tray. And it doesn't have to look just like mine. You can do it however you want. This is your map, so you design it the way you want it to look. Now we're going to add our water. So I used blue for my water. So you are going to fill in the rest of your tray with that blue Play-Doh around your continents. And here we go, here is my map. Yours should look a little something like this too. 
Something else that you can add to your map are some animals. So I chose to add some sea creatures. So I have my scissors, my colored pencils, and my paper. And I drew a jellyfish, an octopus, and some little fish. And then I cut them out and I'm gonna add them to my map. So you can do any creatures that you want. You can do the sea creatures or maybe you could do some land animals on your continents. So you could draw maybe a cat or a dog or maybe a lion or a zebra, whatever you want. So I'm going to take my little sea creatures and add them to my map. And that's it, here is my completed map. I'm sure you all made some pretty cool maps too. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for It's Elementary. I hope you had fun making a map with me today and drawing some little sea creatures, or maybe you drew some land animals. I've got my sea creatures here to say goodbye, my jellyfish, I've got my octopus. I did have a fish, but I don't know where it went. You know, maybe you can find it for me. Well, anyway, please keep an eye on Calvert Library's social media pages for more children's fun. Bye until next time.